All right, well, let's get started. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our update on Duquesne's College of Medicine, the university's first new college in more than 20 years, featuring our provost, Dr. David Dalsey, and our founding medical college dean, Dr. John Kaufman. My name is Adam Beers, an AVP for Advancement and moderator for tonight's program. I'm pleased to have you all join us. Before we jump into the introduction of John and David, I'd like to take a moment and thank my colleagues in alumni engagement for their assistance in arranging this program, and specifically my colleague, Sarah Sperry, who is managing the technical aspects of tonight's webinar. <clears throat> Throughout the presentation, your microphones will be muted, but you are welcome to submit questions through the chat feature found at the bottom of your screen and pre-submitted questions will be reviewed at the end of the webinar, time permitting. Now I'd like to take an opportunity, a moment to introduce our presenters, Dr. David Dalsey and Dr. John Kaufman. David joined Duquesne University as Executive Vice President and Provost in July of 2018, an internationally recognized epidemiologist. Dr. Dalsey has put his background in public health to use in envisioning and putting the plans in place to introduce a College of Medicine at Duquesne University. His vision involves training future physicians guided by the mission of the university while also aiming to help meet the tremendous need for primary care physicians in the region. Thanks for agreeing to participate this evening, David. You're welcome. Next, I'm honored to introduce Dr. John Kaufman, the founding dean of our proposed College of Medicine. Dr. Kaufman joined Duquesne University in January 2020 after serving as founding dean and chief academic officer of the Campbell University John M. Wallace School of Osteopathic Medicine in Bowie's Creek, North Carolina. During his tenure at Campbell University, Dr. Kaufman played an integral role in the school's launch and critical school's launch and critical accreditation process. The Wallace School was the first medical school to open in North Carolina in 35 years and is presently the state's only osteopathic medical school. Prior to his role at Campbell University, Dr. Kaufman served in several capacities at the Edward Via, Via College of Osteopathic Medicine. In 2006, he was named Associate Dean for Postgraduate Affairs, and in 2010, was promoted to Vice Dean for Postgraduate Affairs of, of the Virginia and South Carolina campuses. Under Kaufman's leadership at VCOM, the number of residency position, positions increased from 40 to 280 in family medicine, internal medicine, dermatology, and neurosurgery. Dr. Kaufman also worked for the University Hospitals of Cleveland from 2001 to 2006, during which he established university-based university osteopathic residencies in dermatology, pediatrics, as well as community-based residencies, which included family medicine, internal medicine, and sports medicine. Duquesne University is fortunate to have two leaders, such as David and John, who possess both the vision, expertise, and experience for the College of Medicine. Without further ado, David and John, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you so much, Adam, uh, for the gracious introduction. We're so glad to have uh, so many alumni and friends and uh, a few uh, faculty and staff joining us this evening for a discussion of our College of Medicine. I'm going to start out with a quick introduction and then uh, we'll pass it over to Dean Kaufman uh, to tell us uh, some specifics about the new school itself. Uh, one of the things I want to begin the discussion with is just talking about how much this school, this new school of medicine, is tied to our mission. Uh, all of you are so aware of that mission to serve God by serving others, um, and that is really what we do. Um, and so what we are working on right now is creating a school that is going to help us to expand um, our work towards our mission um, in the area of medicine. Next slide, John. One of the things that is really fantastic about Duquesne is the fact that we have been so rooted in our community. We've actually grown up with the city of Pittsburgh over the last 140 years, uh, and uh, Duquesne has been on the bluff as part of that. We also are tied to healthcare in the community, and we have more than a century of training healthcare professionals in pharmacy and nursing and a wide variety of other areas. And I know many of you who are on this uh, Zoom presentation this evening are graduates of those programs. It's also aligned with our new strategic plan. Our strategic plan emphasizes 
um, interprofessional training, community engagement, and integrative health and well-being. And those things are really critical as we think about how we continue to grow as a university. I wanted to tell you a little bit about our integrative health mission, which is tied to this. So as all of you are aware, we have, um, this will be our fifth health-focused school at the university after nursing, health science, pharmacy, and then natural and environmental sciences, where 70% of the students go on to pursue health-related careers. The, th the reason this is so important is the fact that, John, can you go back one slide? Sure. Um, the reason this is so important is that it really helps us to um, serve communities of need in all of these different areas. Um, we are focused on, of course, marginalized populations and how we serve those populations. We've got a great success record um, in, uh, in the community related to integrative health and related to that. And we're a trusted partner with community partners, including federally qualified um, health centers. Uh, we are one of the only collaborators that works with them, and we will be the only medical school collaborator working directly um, and placing our students in the FH or FQHCs throughout Pittsburgh. Next slide. Um, one of the things that has been really great has been our work in the community related to COVID. We've seen um, expanded partnerships in the work that we're doing right now. And uh, we've provided COVID vaccines in the Hill District. Our pharmacy and nursing and PA students have been great partners in that effort. Next slide. In addition to that, we have a number of other clinics and things that we do in the community. Um, all of you are probably aware of our pharmacy clinic, which we now partner with UPMC to provide. Uh, we have an asthma clinic that has achieved um, uh, national recognition in terms of some of the work it has done to improve asthma in areas throughout Pittsburgh. Many of you probably know Pittsburgh has one of the lower air qualities of any city uh, in the country, despite the fact our tremendous progress of working with uh, mills and private industry to reduce air pollution, it still remains very high and our asthma clinic has seen great successes in that area. Next slide. So we are hopeful that all of our work in integrative health and all of our established relationships with all of our health partners throughout our region will help us to lay the groundwork for the College of Medicine and some of the community engagement work that we will engage in. Next slide. We're gonna give a quick update on the College of Medicine and I'm going to hand it off to John uh, with the next slide, but I just wanted to say a little bit more about our mission and, and why this is so mission centric. Uh, the first part of it is that um, we are right now in the process of pursuing bigger goals as a university. And as a matter of fact, um, that's our new tagline that we talk to students about finding bigger goals for themselves and pursuing bigger goals. And so this ties into that. We're also leveraging in many regards the tremendous success we've had over the last hundred years in training health professionals. Um, we have one of the top ranked nursing programs in the country. We have uh, one of the top ranked private pharmacy schools in the country. Our health science school is growing leaps and bounds. And uh, in Bees Knees or our Bayer school, uh, we've seen a tremendous growth of research that is healthcare focused. Um, amongst our PhD programs in chemistry uh, and uh, biology. We also have a successful biochemistry program and physics program. As all of you are, are aware, those are great things to leverage uh, when it comes to creating a college of medicine, including our own anatomy lab, which has been centrally focused in our school of health science. We really believe there's gonna be a benefit to all students in all fields, but also to our entire region. So I'm gonna pass it off to Dr. Kaufman who is going to walk you through some of the specifics of the school, starting with the mission and the vision. John? Thank you, David. And it's certainly a pleasure to speak with you all this evening. And I'm very excited about our mission. I think it fits well with Duquesne's mission of service. So we're gonna train physicians who will serve God by caring for people, especially in the underserved urban and rural communities of Western Pennsylvania, the nation and the world with a special emphasis on addressing healthcare disparities amongst these underserved communities. And our vision is to create a culture of servant leaders who will put other needs ahead of their own and dedicated to treating the whole person, mind, body, and spirit. I think we're all aware that we're in the midst of a physician shortage. When I started the school in North Carolina 10 years ago, the projection was that by 2020, we'd be 100,000 physicians short, 
the new projection is by 2032, we'll be 122,000 physicians short. And that's in spite of building many new medical schools and many existing schools expanding their class size. Really one of the rate limiting factors is lack of residency training programs. And so that's something we're certainly gonna address um, with our um, partners. In terms of med school debt, that's one of the things that hinder students going into primary care specialties, such as family medicine. Now this number of 190,000 is a little on the low side because it incorporates private and public schools. Public schools often are um, state subsidized. So um, the debt for private schools is actually a little higher than that. Um, nationally, only 20% of med school grads choose primary care. Our school numbers will be higher we anticipate somewhere around 50%. And part of that is the selection process. We will ask students when they apply to med school what they wanna go into and we'll give preference to students who wanna be primary care docs. We'll also be looking for students who um, come from the region as well. Certainly COVID-19 has existed some of the problems in healthcare. Um, the shortage of primary care physicians, again, urban, rural areas hit the hardest, lack of ass access, health disparities. Um, and so um, studies have shown that the number of primary care doctors in an area is directly proportional to morbidity and mortality. Um, one of the things that we want to address is the lack of diversity in healthcare. And so we're going to be looking for students um, and have a diverse um, pool to choose from. And uh, we're going to be looking for students who are interested in um, health equity and how do we close that gap. Um, the other thing is the medical school at Duquesne will be a different model. Uh, traditionally, uh, medical schools are in large research universities that have large research university hospitals. This is a brilliant model for training researchers and subspecialists, but actually a poor model for training primary care docs and general specialists who will go out and practice in underserved regions. And so by choosing students who have a heart for our mission, who have a heart for rural care and urban care, and, and health equity, we believe that we'll be able to help close the equity gap and um, train more physicians for rural and urban underserved areas. In terms of accreditation, we're currently in applicant status. The next phase will be candidate status. And our goal is to have this uh, accomplished by the end of this year. And um, once we have that, we'll start working on pre-accreditation and our goal is to have that by July of 2023. You can only be in that status for five years and you have to graduate a class within that time. So you start one year before matriculation and um, you graduate your first class before that five years uh, runs out. We will not be allowed to recruit students until July of 2023 when we have pre-accreditation status. In terms of our curriculum, this really is the vision of our provost and our curriculum will be very forward thinking, very cutting edge, incorporating the latest in technology. Um, with anatomy, it's a good example of how it's important when you're a new school to train using cadavers, but we'll augment that with augmented reality uh, using a virtual anatomy program pioneered at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we'll also incorporate ultrasound training because if we're gonna be training primary care docs who will be in under-resourced areas, um, ultrasound is a affordable technology you can have right there in the office. And it's great for, for um, treating joint problems and lung problems and heart problems. And uh, so we're very excited um, about this. Uh, we will be the third um, DO Catholic school in the U.S. We're very proud of that. And um, the students will come here for their first two years. They'll train on campus. And then we have 10 um, hospitals who have agreed to uh, participate with us in the uh, region here. And as uh, David mentioned, two federally qualified health centers. 
And so they'll spend the first two years here and then they'll move out into the communities where these hospitals are located. Um, five of the 10 hospitals currently have residencies. The other five have expressed in interest in developing residencies and we've already begun that work. And so the idea is that after students live in these communities for two years and hopefully stay there and do a family medicine or primary care residency, they will have a high likelihood of settling in the area and practice there. The other thing that's important um, for Duquesne's curriculum that is quite frankly lacking in a lot of medical school curriculums are an understanding of things like implicit bias, cultural awareness, health disparities, all things very much brought to the forefront through the COVID pandemic. Um, as I mentioned, we can start to recruit once we have pre-accreditation. We'll matriculate our first class of 85 students in August 1st of 2024. The next year, we can go up to 127. And by the third year, we'll be at 170 students. So by 2029, we'll have a total of um, more than 650 students uh, in the medical school. This is a view here of the LifeWorks building, and this is looking towards Oakland down Fords Avenue. We've purchased this building and uh, we'll begin uh, demolition at the end of the summer. That'll be completed by next January and the site will be ready to begin construction of the new medical school in March of 2022. This is a, uh, a rendition of the building. We're just um, beyond excited at how it's turned out. Lots of glass, lots of light. And if you remember the last picture went right out to the sidewalk. We'll have a nice green space here uh, where students can uh, sit outside on a nice warm uh, spring day and study. Uh, this is just another view here. Um, this is um, the entrance off of Forbes Avenue here to the left. And uh, this is um, um, the uh, lower lobby here. The virtual anatomy uh, lab will be off here to the right. This is the upper lobby um, outside of the uh, main classroom, another uh, area for relaxing and um, studying. This is our modern team-based learning classroom. Students will sit in uh, small groups. It'll be very interactive. And um, we're very excited to have such a beautiful and, and modern space. This is our simulation hospital. We'll have an um, emergency room, an operating room, an ICU, a labor and delivery suite. And um, the technology is advanced. Um, tremendously over the past 20 years. And there's a lot of virtual um, reality and um, augmented reality using HoloLens technology that has now been incorporated into simulation. And um, it's, it's a far cry from medical education just um, 20 to 25 years ago. This is um, on the second floor here, looking down into the classroom, more uh, study carols, and some soft seating area here for students. This is in the Gunberg Library. We'll have the third floor. We'll share it with um, um, healthcare, but um, we will have 20 small group rooms as well as 75 uh, study carols here. Um, so lots of quiet study space. This is also where the medical library will be located. Uh, of course, medical libraries now are largely uh, virtual with thousands of electronic periodicals and textbooks, but we will have some reference text there um, for people like me who like paper. At this point, I'll turn it back to Dr. Dowsey just to give some closing remarks. Great, thank you, uh, John, John, for that great presentation. Uh, hopefully you're excited about this as much as we are. You can see uh, just from the renderings um, how much this building is going to change the face of campus. It'll be right opposite uh, the new UPMC Cooper Fieldhouse. It's really going to be a new front door to the campus on one side celebrating the academic success and the uh, push uh, for the improvements to many of our D1 sports teams, including basketball. And then on the other side of the street, you're going to have 
um, uh, shining uh, new building, highlighting um, some of our push in academics and some of the things we really are dreaming about in academics. So we're excited to answer your questions about this and uh, feel free, you can enter them into the chat. Um, and as well as that, we have some questions uh, that came in advance. So I will yeah. pass it over to Adam, who's going to be our moderator and ask questions. Thank you, David. Thank you, John. Yeah, we had a number of questions come in through the chat and I'll, I'll kick things off by uh, talking, asking a question related to technology. And this, this question specifically is, how will technology be leveraged to differentiate the school? Well, as I mentioned, you know, there will be a lot of technology. Um, if you look at the classroom there, there will be a microphone um, at each um, uh, desk there so that when students ask questions, one of the big challenges, you know, in a big auditorium, knowing where the question is coming, has everyone heard it, do you have to repeat it? So this will really uh, eliminate that. Um, and then, uh, as I mentioned, in uh, anatomy, using um, augmented reality with HoloLens technology. And to be honest, when we first looked at it, I was kind of not sure. Um, and really went to the presentation at Doubter and was just blown away. I mean, they can take any organ and make it six feet tall. You can walk through it. And so uh, when you are teaching anatomy in groups of six or eight, everyone is wearing the HoloLens. Everything is seeing the, the same thing. And so I think this is really going to revolutionize um, training. Thanks, John. Um, can you talk a little bit about which hospitals the, the College of Medicine will be partnering with for clinical experiences? Sure, absolutely. And um, at this point where we are is we have letters of support. So they're non-binding, but, um, you know, the um, Armstrong um, Memorial in Catanning has pledged their support, Butler, Excella, Heritage Valley, Indiana Regional, Meadville, Mon Valley, um, PCHS. Um, St. Clair Hospital, Trinity Health, and uh, UPMC. And, um, you know, we, we're talking with them about um, Mercy Hospital, which is ideal, literally right across the street. So we're very excited. Um, and every hospital that we, we've talked to has been equally excited and um, equally interested in uh, partnering with us. Excellent. I'll jump over to the chat line here. Uh, can you talk a little bit, of Dr. Kaufman, about how the medical school will enhance all of the health science and nursing programs? Absolutely. So um, all of our accreditation standards now require us to work together. And it's really for the better of medicine. Um, you know, when I trained in medicine, we didn't really have a lot of interaction until the clinical years. And we realized that that's not the best. Um, and so it's important really from the very beginning for us to incorporate training that's multidisciplinary. And so um, you saw the picture of the simulation hospital. And so we'll have the opportunity to be in the ICU with medical students, nursing students, PA students, pharmacy students, each participating in the care of the patient in their traditional roles. But I also like to change it up and have them each play each other's roles because until you, you know, walk them out in their shoes, you don't really realize um, the challenges and, and the information and what they bring um, to healthcare. And so um, very excited to um, build these kind of interprofessional scenarios. Very good. This is a, an enrollment related question. Um, will acceptance preferences be given to Duquesne students or to PA residents who um, want to practice in Western Pennsylvania? Absolutely. And so Duquesne has, has always been a phenomenal pre-med school. And so there's a huge pool of students. My goal is to get as many of them as I can into the medical school. And um, also a preference for PA students because um, if you're from the area, you're more likely to go back home and practice. So that helps us meet our mission. And so we are very interested in uh, when we're allowed. So we're currently not allowed to recruit um, and talk to students, but come 2023, we'll be very interested in um, meeting as many uh, folks as we can from the area and uh, recruiting them into the med school. And staying in the enrollment area, 
somebody asked, will there be a track by which a student applies as an undergrad to Duquesne University and then can therefore maybe reserve or have a seat in, in the medical school if they maintain a, a quality QPA? Absolutely. We're very interested in building an, an early acceptance program so that students will be identified at matriculation to Duquesne. And um, if they maintain a certain GPA, attain a certain MCAT, and um, of course have a good interview, then there's a spot waiting for them there. And, um, you know, we'll be very excited to build that program. Jumping over to kind of more an academic clinical uh, question, can you talk a little bit about the, the hiring process for faculty? Sure. Um, you know, one of our goals is to increase diversity in medicine. And so we think it's important to have diversity amongst our faculty, diversity amongst our staff. And so we will be, you know, posting positions and um, really hoping for a diverse applicant pool. Um, and, you know, we're um, committed to hiring the best and brightest faculty. And um, there's already folks reaching out and i um, excited about that. In North Carolina, we hired a lot of our faculty um, from Hopkins um, who had done postbacs there. We had faculty from UNC, Duke. I had one faculty member who authors Rubin's textbook of pathology, and he worked three days a week at UNC, two days a week for me. And so, you know, we certainly are um, hoping, um, and, and Pittsburgh, you know, will be a huge help for us uh, recruiting folks. So we expect to really um, do national searches and get the best and brightest folks out there. I may have missed this, but the question came in around the percent of new medical faculty, what percent of them will be tenured upon hiring? Sure, sure. We will not um, be offering a tenure track. And then this question came in from the chat line uh, around the uh, medical technology. It says, what support will there be for education technology beyond the software and equipment, and how will the faculty be, be supported to use it? Sure, so we will certainly have AV, IT um, staff, faculty who will um, help us. And, um, you know, a lot of um, the technology, there's a learning curve. And so we'll have faculty development programs to make sure that everyone uh, is up to speed using it. And this is, somewhat related to accreditation, how many full-time faculty members are required by the accrediting body to be hired and on campus in order to start uh, classes? Sure. So um, the accreditor is vague on this because their um, standards revolves around your curriculum. And so uh, different medical schools have different curriculums. And so they require you to have a sufficient number a faculty to deliver your curriculum. And so we will be evaluated by um, COCA commissioners. They will go through our documents and they'll make a determination. And I will have to, to you know, answer questions uh, and give testimony and defend you know, the numbers that we have. So I'm sorry, it's not an exact number, but you have to explain. We do um, faculty adequacy modeling and so we basically look at um, the labs that are being delivered, our clinical skills, musculoskeletal labs are the most faculty intense. So they want to know what our what our what our are our faculty to student ratios, and we have to show them how we're meeting that. So uh, real quick, uh, we have about 500 full-time faculty at uh, Duquesne, and the medical school will increase that by a little more than 10%. Perspective. Does the this is a facility related question? Does Duquesne have plans to expand the facility after initial construction to include other clinics or research facilities? I'll ask the provost to come. <laughs> we do actually. As a matter of fact, we have um, a pretty expansive view of the Forbes corridor and uh, what we could do with that space. Uh, there are additional properties for acquisition under consideration, and there are a number of different plots that we already own 
uh, where we could develop them. Um, and so uh, stay tuned. Uh, we are very interested in continuing to expand our uh, reputation in this area, but also our capacity. Um, and that could include uh, additional research facilities um, as we uh, continue to grow. And I want to emphasize to everyone that the first student would enroll until August of 24, uh, with the first graduating class happening four years following that. So it's going to be a little while before you know we're going to be able to fully uh, leverage all of the different things we're doing here uh, to maximize them to continue our expansion. Can you talk about um, any anticipated collaborations with the medical school down the street at University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine? Sure, we, we are very happy to um, collaborate. And um, a lot of that is dependent upon the faculty that we hire. And so there will be common research interests. And so in North Carolina, we had faculty that collaborated with Duke, some collaborated with Wake Forest. We had hired uh, a gentleman to teach pharmacology who had done his postdoc at Wake Forest. And then he was able to, um, get an NIH grant with them. And so, you know, research would be the common area uh, to collaborate, but, you know, we're certainly open to collaboration on all levels. And we've been partnering and talking with uh, folks at UPMC and Pitt at the highest levels, including the chancellor um, uh, for Pitt and including um, the, the senior leaders of the UPMC healthcare system. As a matter of fact, um, some of those leaders sat on our selection team that brought in Dr. Kaufman. Uh, we are quite confident that uh, we will have a successful and fruitful collaborations with both Pitt and UPMC. This is a community related question. Um, you talked about a little bit early in the, in the presentation about the, the community impact, but I wanted to revert back to this question and how, how you talk a little bit more about how you see the medical school directly impacting Pittsburgh, its neighborhoods, our uptown uh, neighbors. Sure. Um, this is, you know, the, the most, you know, the biggest opportunity that I see that we have need all around us. And we have tremendous organizations um, like PCHS that is um, invested in the community. And so um, our students will have the opportunity to go to the different sites in the, in the communities and shadow students in the first two years. We're also going to have an EMT program and try to get as many of our students through that as possible. We would like to offer that prior to matriculation so that students in the first two years can participate with the community um, ambulance services. Um, the other thing that uh, we would like to do is a student run free clinic. And uh, we've talked to PCHS about that. So in our communities of need, having a free clinic in the evening for people who you know, have to work during the day. And so here's an opportunity to come in, be seen in the evening, bring your children in and, and provide a, a much needed service to the community. And, and Adam, I wanna emphasize, you know, it's very important to note that the Hill District and Uptown have been really hit by the pandemic. And as a matter of fact, um, those communities uh, find themselves in the conditions uh, they were in in the 1980s when things were uh, very difficult. Uh, we are committed as a university to working with those communities to continue to expand and grow the communities and help uh, those communities in this time of need. Uh, it's important to note that there is an Uptown partnership. Duquesne has been central to that partnership. As a matter of fact, President Gormley's Chief of Staff, Mary Ellen Solomon, is um, in charge of that task force and has been working with the community. So we'll continue to partner with them hand in hand. Uh, we are quite confident that with the new Vision Center UPMC is putting in place, our new UPMC Cooper Fieldhouse, our new College of Medicine, the new development that the Penguins are doing, that is going to be residential and retail, and the site that used to be the Civic Arena, you're going to see big things happening. And then finally, the city is actually building a park in the overpass of 579 and 279. Uh, they've capped those overpasses and they're presently putting a park there. So for those of you that have not been to campus in a while, um, if you come back here in five years, you're not gonna recognize it in a good way. You're spot on with that, David. Uh, we just have a couple questions left. Um, 
Somebody asked, uh, this is another, this is the last question regarding to clinical and academic. Do you have a need for, uh, for clinical lecturers, Dr. Kaufman? Absolutely, we sure do. <laughs> uh, Always. You know, all different clinical areas um, will need to be covered. Um, and, and that's an important thing to talk about for a minute that um, the first semester of the curriculum will be, you know, anatomy, physiology, biochem, pharmacology, microbiology. But starting in the second semester, we'll go through systems. So musculoskeletal and then behavioral with neuroanatomy. Then the second year starts with cardiology, pulmonary, then nephro, hematology, immunology, um, GI, endocrine, and then reproductive health. So all of those specialty areas uh, will require lectures. And it's important to us that we're bringing folks in from the community who are practicing in these specialties who can introduce cases that they've just recently had. That's what makes it fresh and interesting for the students. So yes, we're very interested in that. A question from the chat line, I just miss a, uh, just saw it come through. How will you partner with programs in the health sciences regarding resources? Well, I think, you know, we're bringing some additional resources. So we're going to partner with the PA school around the virtual anatomy and the physical therapy school. Um, and so we're bringing in additional faculty. So, um, you know, lots of opportunities to collaborate. Uh, as a matter of fact, with the anatomy lab, we had to figure out how to share um, the space. And so we had to get very innovative and out of the box. We'll have double decker cadaver uh, tables. And so we'll have four sections instead of the usual two. And then we'll be able to share cadavers uh, with the PA students, with the PT students. And so, you know, it's, it's an all hands on deck effort. And the PA fac anatomy faculty, PT faculty will be teaching the medical students, medical student faculty, we hope will be teaching, you know, the students in the other schools. And so, you know, it's a, it's a great opportunity to just be very collaborative in a lot of different ways. And John, John, I think the, um, uh, the anatomy lab you've just mentioned is a good example. That lab is going to increase in size significantly, better lighting, better facilities. So uh, that would not have happened but for the medical school. We've got the Sim Hospital and the medical school, which um, students in health science uh, can use as part of their training, which is something that uh, they would not have had access to prior. There are a lot of things where um, all boats should rise as a result of having a College of Medicine at Duquesne. You mentioned earlier uh, Duquesne being the third uh, Catholic medical school in the country. A question was posed that as a, as, a, as a Catholic university, how does religion factor into the curriculum that we develop in our medical school? Sure, that's an excellent question. And so to be clear, we'll be the third Catholic DO medical school. There are, you know, additional uh, MD Catholic medical schools. Well, that's one of the things that really attracted me here, that um, Duquesne is a faith-based university. I like the fact that we're ecumenical, so people of all faiths are welcome. So our faculty will come from different faiths. Our students will come from different faiths. But again, we're going to hold fast to our Catholic traditions. These go back thousands of years, and it's important for people to understand where we stand on issues. Um, I think it's important for students to grapple with some of these issues. They have to decide for themselves. You know, in a lot of vocations, you don't really have to commit yourself. In medicine, you do more than others. And so we'll have an opportunity to talk about the sanctity of human life and why it's important to us. And, um, you know, lots of case scenarios um, can be developed that don't necessarily tell people what to believe but they push the boundaries of their beliefs and make them really examine why they believe what they believe. Because, you know, we're in a time where there's a lot of change and, um, you know, rel uh, moral relativity. Um, and so, you know, we hold fast to our, our beliefs and uh, yet how do we navigate um, the ever-changing world that we live in? So I look at it as, as an opportunity. I tell faculty that we have more academic freedom than you will find at other universities, um, as long as people are agreeing to talk about these things. 
Very good. Thanks. Thanks, John. I've got two final questions here. One, can you discuss the, it's really, I guess, not a question, but the more of a discussion. Can you discuss the impact that philanthropy will have on advancing the mission of the College of Medicine? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, it's very hard to, um, to start a new school without generous donors. And we're so appreciative um, to the donors have, who have stepped up at this point. And you know, we're continually talking to folks, um, but, you know, the technology, medicine, um, you know, people wonder why, why is medicine so expensive today? You know, 50 years ago, $2 uh, to have a baby. Well, um, because of the technology, we didn't have ICUs until the 1960s. And when people were born at home, you had a lot of maternal deaths. And so with technology, um, we've, we're doing much better in the morbidity and mortality areas, but that all comes with a cost. And so in order to train um, physicians who are ready to step into high-tech residencies, um, it's very expensive now um, to build a medical school. And so we couldn't do it without our generous donors, and we're very grateful um, to have them. John, a question popped into the chat line, so I'll say it's still two more questions. Are, are, are there residency partnerships that students can form while at Duquesne to ensure they do select a, a primary care or family medicine uh, residency? Absolutely. So our focus will be on the four traditional areas of primary <laughs> care, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, and OB. Um, my hope is out of our 10 hospitals, we'll have one of each of those, except pediatrics. Pediatrics, you really need to have a pediatric hospital. The problem with building something like that in Pittsburgh is you already have one of the top peds hospitals in the world. And so peds is, is not that difficult to get into. And so we will have a very successful match rate into pediatrics. Um, but for the other ones, we will build family medicine residencies. I think we'll build several of them, internal medicine residencies. I'm hoping for at least one OB residency. And then there's additional residencies that are important to have. General surgery is important. Um, psychiatry, extremely important. Emergency medicine. So if you look at those seven areas, that'll probably account for about 75% of what our students go into. But, you know, one of the hospitals asked me, what about dermatology? I've built a derm residency pretty much everywhere I've been. And so, you know, we're very interested in building that here. And there'll be other things that are opportunities. One of my program directors in orthopedics is now in the area here, trained uh, foot and ankle at Ohio State. So I'll reach out to him, see if he'll be interested in building an orthopedic residency. So my goal, is to really look at what are the needs of our students and try to build those residencies. Again, the more we can do here, the more our graduates will stay here. Excellent. And as a, as a wrap up question, and kind of looking forward into the future, um, where do you envision the, the future of osteopathic medicine to be in the next five to 10 years? Well, five to 10 years will probably look similar to now, um, but you know, when you look at where we've come, um, you know, our growth has really been tremendous. Um, you know, the curve was very flat uh, for about 100 um, or so years. But in the, in the past 20, 30 years, the slope of that curve is, is very steep. And so we're growing at a faster rate than allopathic schools. We currently have one out of every four medical students is in a DO school. And so over time, that'll translate to more and more DOs, but we are predominantly in primary care. And so um, this positions us very well for the future. The other thing that we haven't really talked much about is just our focus on treating the whole patient. And so it's important in medicine that you have someone that is looking at you globally. I had a woman came in one day with a bladder infection. I diagnosed the thyroid cancer. And so you always really need to be looking at the whole person. And that's mind, body, and spirit. And, and you know, we need more of that in medicine because 
office visits, you know, you get a short period of time, you know, give me your main problem, let's treat it and we can give you a medicine. But we want to train doctors who are different, who really take the time, spend the time with you, find out how are things at home. You know, we don't exist in a vacuum. We exist in our, in our family units. So, you know, we're, we have an opportunity here to really focus on health and wellness and prevention. And so that's one of the, the great things about building a new school. You have a chance to reflect on how can we do things differently? How can we improve the system? Very good. Well, in wrap it up, seeing the time here, it's about 7.45. I think we've gotten everything answered. So I wanted to thank you and David and John for, for your presentation and update on the College of Medicine and for answering the questions from the group. There will be a follow-up email from, from Sarah and the Alumni Engagement Group. If you have additional questions, you can reach out to, to Dr. Kaufman. I just wanna thank everybody who took part today I really feel like this is an exciting time at, at, Duquesne, at Duquesne University. I want to thank you all, all of our alumni, our faculty, staff, and friends for attending this evening's program. And in a, a follow-up uh, email, there'll be a recording of the program as well that you can share. So I want to thank everybody for joining us this evening. Stay safe. And as always, go Dukes. Thank you. Thank you all.